Hi, and thanks for watching. We're introduced to Jesus Christ in the first verse of the New Testament as Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It's an intriguing introduction to the person we know as Jesus Christ, and it references back to ancestors of his who are found in the Old Testament. To these two ancestors of David, uh, of Jesus Christ, that being David and Abraham, were given some great promises, and we want to have a look at, quick look at them today. Jesus Christ, in, in the last chapter of the Bible, says that he is the root and the offspring of David. So he starts in the first chapter of the New Testament as being introduced as the son of David, and in the last chapter he says he's the root and offspring of David. So what is Jesus referring to here? When we go back and we look at the life of David, who was king of Israel in the Old Testament times, we find that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God made a great promise to David. And he said to David that after he was dead and buried, that God would give him a descendant. This descendant would not only be the son of David, but would also be the son of God. Not only that, but God said that this descendant would establish again the throne of David. God would give to him a kingdom, a kingdom which would last forever. So these were great promises which were brought great expectation into the, Jew, into the Jews. They ever thereafter looked for this coming Messiah, the one who would be the great king. When we come to Luke chapter 1, we read there the section where the angel came and visited Mary. And when the angel came to visit Mary and inform her that she was going to bear the son Jesus Christ, God said, or the angel said to Mary, that this one that would be called would be named Jesus. And it says he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. So he was going to be great. He was going to be called the son of the highest, the son of God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob, another name for Israel. He would reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So here, in fulfilment of the promise that God had made thousands of years before to David, the angel tells Mary she is going to have that son, the son of David, the son of God, and he was to be Jesus Christ. So that clause of the promise that God made to David has been fulfilled. Jesus Christ has come. He is the son of David. He is the son of God. And in fact, this was picked up by those who respected Jesus for his beliefs. In fact, he was many times called the son of David. And as Jesus entered the Jerusalem just before his death, the people cried out and they said, Hosanna to the son of David, because they saw him as the one coming, the great king. However, Jesus has never gained that throne. He has not sat upon the throne of David. He was rejected as being king. So this promise, while Jesus has come, the son of David, the son of God, the other part of the promise, that being that he would have a kingdom and that kingdom will be established forever, has not yet been fulfilled and we wait to see that come. David actually spoke of this kingdom, if you're interested in having a look at it, in Psalm 72, where he prays about this kingdom coming. And Jesus has taught us also to pray for that kingdom, hasn't he? In the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. So we pray for a kingdom on earth. This is the kingdom which God promised to King David. There's another, or the other ancient ancestor of Jesus mentioned there in Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 was Abraham. And God also made a great promise to Abraham. And that promise really spans from Genesis chapter 12 through to Genesis chapter 22. Different clauses, little additions that were made to this covenant of promise which God made to his friend Abraham. In particular, in Genesis chapter 22, the Lord God said to Abraham, he said, Blessing I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And your descendants will beget, possess the gate of their enemies. And in particular note, it says in verse 18, In your seed 
All nations of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham was promised that he would be blessed, that he would have a multitudinous seed, so many that you wouldn't be able to count them, and that those that seed of, of Abraham would in fact be triumphant over its enemies. And particularly of note for us that in the seed, all nations would be blessed. All nations, all families, all peoples of the earth would be blessed through that seed of Abraham. And that seed, we know from Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, was, in fact, Jesus Christ. And what was this blessing then that that would come through this son of Abraham? What was promised to Abraham when God said to him, in your seed all nations of the earth will be blessed? Well, we're told in Acts chapter 3, verse 25 and 26, exactly what it is. We read there, speaking to the Jewish people of those days, it says, You are the sons of the prophets. And of the covenant or the promise which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, In your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. So there he references the fact that this promise was made to Abraham, that in his seed all families of the earth will be blessed. And it goes on in verse 26 to explain who and what. It says, To you first... God having raised up his servant Jesus. So there it is, that's the who. The seed of Abraham was this servant Jesus. And what did he come to do? Well, he sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquity. So there it was, the great blessing that would come through Jesus, the seed of Abraham, was the forgiveness of sins, turning everyone away from their iniquities. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul says that that statement that was made back in in Genesis chapter 22 when God said that in Abraham's seed all nations would be blessed, Paul says that that was in fact when the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying... In you all nations shall be blessed. So the gospel, rather than just belonging to the New Testament, was in fact introduced in the Old. It was the promise of the coming Messiah, the promised seed of Abraham, the promise of a blessing to come when people would be saved from their sins. And that was the role of Jesus Christ, wasn't it? To save us from our sins. Told in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, She shall bring forth a son, And you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So that was the blessing that would come through Abraham. So these Old Testament promises concerning David and Abraham relate to Jesus Christ in his work in saving us from our sins and delivering us into the kingdom. There's other clauses in the promise that God made to Abraham. That concerns the possession of a vast tract of land which God showed to Abraham that would be given to Abraham and to his descendants, to his heirs, forever. And that's another interesting topic. And in fact, it ties in with the fact that God's kingdom is coming to this earth. There is another more obscure promise that is given right back in Genesis chapter 3. Now, this is when sin enters the world. And when God came to pass a curse upon the serpent, he said to the serpent... I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So there, in fact, it's not contained as a a promise as such. It's actually the curse upon the serpent. But it's a curse that Adam and Eve would have listened very closely to because this involved them. It involved the woman and her seed, the descendants of Adam and Eve. And it says there that there would be enmity between the seed of the serpent, the descendants of the serpent, and the descendants of the woman, those two ways of thinking. And ultimately, that one, the he referred to there, the seed of the woman, singular, would come and would in fact bruise the serpent's head, would crush the head of the serpent. And the the seed of the serpent here, we pick up a sense of what they are when Jesus refers to those who opposed him in his life as being a brood of vipers, a generation of vipers. In other words, Jesus referred to those who opposed his teaching, who opposed the word of God as being descendants of the snake, descendants of the serpent. 
and he had a struggle with them. But the seed of the serpent, or the head of the serpent, is the thinking of sin, otherwise referred to in the scriptures as the devil, or human nature, human thinking, thinking that is opposed to God. And God here hints at the coming of Jesus Christ, who is referred to as the seed of the woman in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. So Jesus Christ comes to fulfill this promise, again, the seed of an earlier promise, the promise that God gave in the Garden of Eden. And he comes and he crushes, he destroys the head of the serpent, he destroys the power of sin. So we can see from these three Old Testament promises that God has revealed through the Old Testament Many stories that that relate to the gospel message, to our salvation, to the hope which we have, to the path away from sin, to the death of sin, and to the forgiveness thereof. So there's many great stories that are contained in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that relate to our salvation, and we'd love to help you explore them all and find out the truth of the Bible.